Hello and welcome to Learn TV channel. My name is Angela and today we will be talking about strategic HR and its implications. Via Zoom, we are welcoming the consultant and management educator Ron Thomas. Ron is a visiting executive faculty member at the Global Human Resources Leadership Institute at Howard University School of Business in Washington, DC, and the facilitator at, at American University of the Emirates, Dubai. He has been identified as one of the top five HR leadership thinkers in the Middle East by CIPD and received the Outstanding Leadership Award for Global HR Excellence at the World Human Resources Development Congress in Mumbai, India. He was also named as one of the 50 most talented global HR leaders in Asia and most recently has inducted into the Leaders Hum Power list of the top 200 biggest voices in leadership to watch for in 2022. Ron, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you as our guest. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you. In its beginnings, human resources was an administrative function that generally was limited to tasks such as hiring employees, managing benefits, and ensuring regulatory compliance. Today, HR is increasingly strategic as it involves aligning a company's workforce with its overall goals. We would like to start by asking you, what is strategic human resource management? Strategic, strategic human resource management is, is about building a workforce that's aligned around strategy. So the anchor of strategic workforce, of strategic human resources, is based on the HR department or profession understanding the strategic approaches of an organization. And you, in turn, design and build a workforce to, that's aligned to that. And what's happening over the past few years, I'm going to say COVID, uh, pre-COVID, COVID to post-COVID, if there is such a thing, there's been a huge transformation because before, as you, re as you referenced the older version of human resources, uh, being more process-driven, um, it was kind of like a department that was on cruise control. And then all of a sudden you entered this storm and there were numerous detours. You know, detours as it relates to the new workforce as it relates to work from home, work from anywhere, safety requirements, business models have changed, new strategy uh, from the organization, new business units they're going into. As a result of that, HR, for the most part, is now sitting at the table because the, the, the solutions that we're going to bring is going to enable the organization to get back to normal. And that means that the approach has to be strategic in understanding the so-called future state of the organization. And you build a workforce that's going to en enable the organization to get to that uh, future state perspective. What are the responsibilities of human resource managers? Well, there's quite a few responsibilities. So I'm going to pull out a, a, a couple. If we think in terms of strategic workforce planning, and I'm talking from future state of, of the profession as well as inside of the organization. Strategic workforce planning, I design workforces. Change management with all of the things that I mentioned in the prior answer, you know, work from home, work from anywhere, whatever hybrid model we're building, the great resignation, which a lot of organizations are facing. Those are huge change management issues. So there's, a, there's an expertise that's needed in how do you drive change inside of an organization. And then it comes back to strategic talent acquisition. It's more, more than just going out and trying to hire people. You have to make sure that your brand is attractive to people that want to join the organization. Because now I could have three or four offers on the table. But if I'm rigid in my approach for, say, I need everybody back into the office five days a week, you're going to lose people. You can't compete in that environment. So talent acquisition is more strategic, which means we have to become immersed in understanding the brand. We have to become immersed in understanding the brand and how we're positioning ourselves as it relates to our competitors. So from a talent perspective, how are we going to compete against the, the organizations that's in the same space that we're in? If you think of your competitors, maybe we need to do a competitor analysis to understand what our competitors are offering. How can we offer a more attractive workplace 
not so much with salary, but what are we going to offer uh, this talented person who may have a choice to go two or three other uh, places to work? So all of these three that I just mentioned is going to drive this future state of human resources. And that's just three that, we're, that I just mentioned. What does strategic HR really mean? Strategic HR really means that we're partnering with the C-suite, that we are part of the C-suite, and the expertise that we bring to that discussion would be people experts, people strategy experts. The finance people bring a financial expertise. The marketing people bring a marketing expertise. So the IT people is bringing a technology expertise. But what's been missing, there's no people strategy sitting in that room. Decisions are made in a lot of cases, and we're not, we're not looking at that through the lens of people. So a lot of organizations may say, you know what, this is the way we do it, and you should be glad to have a job. Well, you know what, if that's the mindset, you're not going to be successful in retaining people because we have to look at it through the lens of the people, the employees that we have employed um, inside of our organization, and more importantly, coming out of COVID, two things that need to happen. We need to listen more and we need to communicate more. Now, whether that's town halls or whatever you want to design, but there needs to be a communication strategy. There should also be an opportunity for us to listen more. I say listen because we sit back and listen to what they're trying to, to, to tell us. Um, because when you look at organizations who have tried to or maybe did not listen, and they created policy. And when that policy became public to those employees and the employees pushed back, that's a perfect example of an organization not listening. And there's a lot of mistakes that's been made in this work from home, work from anywhere, work from hybrid environment. Decisions were made in the so-called C-suite or the big room, as I say. But there was no voice coming from the employee side. And the smart companies will listen, they will collaborate, and they will arrive at some kind of sensible solutions, but they have the input of that employee base, which is, as they say, is the most valuable asset within an organization. HR's role includes developing a plan of HR initiatives to achieve and promote the behavior, culture, and competencies needed to achieve organizational goals. What steps can you take to develop a strategic HR plan? Well, strategic HR plan is going to, it always starts with strategy. So if we were going to design a, a workforce strategy, if you think of three strategic initiatives, future state, we want to be here, here, here. What are the strategic roles that are going to be needed to drive that? And then if we think of the, the if we identify those roles, we can also look back for how many other people are, are working inside of that department. There was a metaphor that I like to use, and if you think of every strategic initiative as a bus, someone's driving the bus, and then you think of who's sitting on the bus. That is your succession pipeline, and these are the people we're developing just in case someone were to leave, and we, we have this availability of talent inside of the organization, sort of like a greenhouse. We bring seeds in, we water, we make sure they get sunlight and all the nutrients they need. And as we need them, we pick from here and we position to that, it, it, that could be into that new uh, strategic uh, initiative that we're working towards. So that takes in the entire talent framework, but it has to be anchored in the strategy. In other words, the future state of the organization. And once we figure that out, we can build out a plan as it relates to that. So the other thing I wanna cover that you mentioned and formulating your question was around culture. So we can, we can design a workforce, but if your culture is not appropriate for people and people are leaving the organization because of your culture, it's gonna to have to be fixed. Because if, if you're trying to drive this to a, a solution phase and your turnover is high, what's causing the turnover? Is it because managers are out of control? 
Is it because your organization does not listen? So this is where the culture piece comes in. And a great way to think about culture is you think about an operating system. If you use Microsoft uh, Windows, that's an operating system. In other words, how do we do things here? Do we promote from within or every time there's an opportunity, we go outside and bring uh, new people in? When we do that, we're creating a vacuum inside of the organization. And your employees see that every time there's something cool, you go outside. So there's no way for me to grow here. And I will go, I will exit, and I will leave and go someplace else. Or another situation, it could be we have managers that are out of control, mistreating people, talking to people any way that they want to talk to people. But the organization does nothing to stop that or try and impede that in some way. That employee, again, will leave the organization. They will leave the organization basically, it could be from that managers being out of control or the organization in allowing that and the organization is out of control. So the people part of the equation is going to be the differentiating factor for success in organizations post, post-COVID, if we, can all, if we can use that term post-COVID. What are the main practical implications of strategic HRM theory? practical implications well if we go back we, we think of of a talent management framework so i talked through strategic workforce planning but let's take a look at the entire spectrum of human resources compensation structure structure maybe we have been paying at 50 percent of market value and maybe we were able to get away with that so compensation would need to be looked at If we think in terms of learning and development, what is learning and development's role in trying to build an organization, develop an organization, develop people so that we have a repository of talented people, going back to the greenhouse effect, that whenever we need people, we can pull people from one department and transition them to another department, or how do we upskill people, say in marketing, if our approach in marketing has been based on an older version of marketing versus the social approach, how are we developing the marketing people to move into this new era of social marketing? Finance, accounts payable at one time was a transactional kind of process. What is the future state of the finance side? Is that more in predictive modeling? Is that more into using kind of a data science approach? If we think in terms of the footprint that each employee uh, leaves inside of an organization, every employee creates what's called data points. The data that I first, my first interview, the data that I submitted an application, how long did that take? I went through three interviews. What, what was the score for that process? What was the score like for the employee journey from the time they submit, possibly until the time they leave? Because no one is going to stay at any organization for 20 years and get a watch. Those days are over with. And you may find turnover in certain key areas. It could be three to five year uh, t- time frame. So if we take a step back and look at all of the functions of human resources, everyone is going to play a, a huge strategic role in trying to build out a new people model for the post-COVID experience. And that has to be done because there's no way that you're going to ride in um, the same model you had coming in pre-COVID, going through COVID and coming out of COVID. Things are going to have to change, even something as simple as leadership capabilities. Um, a friend of mine is with a major firm. I won't say what that firm is. He said in every one of their meetings, they have a red chair sitting in that conference room. And that red chair is the customer. So the decisions we're making, we have to think in terms of the customer sitting in the room. What would be their thoughts as it relates to that? So I take that same theory. When we're in these so-called big rooms making these discussions, what chair is the employee sitting in? Is, is the employee represented in that meeting? If we think in terms of creating policy and we think in terms of having a voice in that room, that should be the employee perspective. So here's how it didn't work. A company says, I need everybody to come back in three days a week. 
And the employee says, how did you arrive at three? No one ever asked us about the three day coming in three days a week. Can we do it in two days? Can we just work from home permanently? If organizations have received pushback, it's because they did not have that employee group mindset sitting in that room when that decision was made. Because the higher you go up on an org chart, the more engaged people are, and the more they feel that everybody wants to be back. So I saw some research the other day, and here's what it said. The higher you go up in an organization, the more they are trying to get people to come back to work. But the lower you, if you go down lower on that totem pole or that R chart, you're going to find that people are saying, I don't want to go back to work five days a week inside of the office. I was just reading a research report, five-day work week to four-day work week. Should that change? Some companies are experimenting with that. So here's, here's how... Uh, Another piece of research I read a, a while back, at one time during the Industrial Revolution, there was a six-day work week, and they changed from a six-day work week to a five-day work week. That was in 1921. It has not changed since then, but COVID has shown us that we can still do work, and maybe we don't have to commute to come in and be sitting inside that room for eight hours, nine hours. So why wouldn't that be why would that not be on the table to be discussed? Now, that would determine the kind of business you're in because if you're in a factory, you're going to need people there, you know, full time for those shifts. But for so-called white collar workers, these are things that organizations are going to have to try and figure out in some way. And the only way we're going to be able to figure it out is that we're going to have to have people who have the we're going to have to have people in other words, the employees to give us their insight as it relates to that. So in other words, we design policy, but we collaborate with everyone around the entire wheel of uh, inside of an organization. How strategic HR impacts the organizational performance? Engagement, productivity, high performance, productivity. So if you think of those, if, if I'm working for an organization, and every decision that organization makes is always in their favor, and it's nothing in my favor, I'm spending time, hour a day, I'm surfing, trying to figure out, or find another job. But you're paying me for eight hours. So the lower the engagement score is inside of the organization, the lower the level of performance is. Because if I'm not engaged and I don't want to be here I'm doing possibly just enough to get by, and I'm not going the extra mile. So when you look at companies that are highly engaged, the financials show that. Highly engaged workforce is going to give you a higher level of business performance. And at one time, and you didn't cover this in my bio, I was the CEO of a great place to work based in Dubai. And the more I read about engagement and the relationship between those two data sets, in other words, the uh, engagement scores and the productivity of an organization, there's been research that says at each level, if, if you're using a one, two, three, four rating system, there's a 20% variable in performance. So if at level three, which is average, they give you 100%. But if that's a level four, they're giving you 120% of output. But if I take that back down to the level two, 80%. The level one, 60%. But throughout that equation, you're paying, or the organization is paying out at 100%, but you're not getting the productivity, which would increase business performance up to that level. What are the benefits and competitive advantages of strategic HR? Well, I think we've kind of covered quite a few of those. The advantage is that you create a, a workplace that people want to work and people want to get there and people are highly engaged, which is in turn is going to make a business case for um, the efficiency of the organization, uh, profitability of the organization. And these are the kind of things that when you manage that most valuable asset, which every so-called leader says people are our greatest asset, 
if that's done the right way, that you build a culture that people want to be there, people can come and grow their career at this organization, you're going to have the business performance and you're going to make the business case as a result of that. But when you do not, you're going to have problems. So think of it this way. If there's a business issue, strategic HR says, if there's a business issue, issue, what is the people issue related to the business issue? Can we make an alignment to that? If we were to fix the business issue, I mean, the uh, people issue relating to the business issue, we're going to increase the performance of the organization. And that could have been a lagging indicators that showed maybe that sales, uh, that new product line is off, t- off target by 30%. Was that a people issue as, a, as it relates to that? It could have been the team. It could have meant that we had high turnover in that particular product line. So another way of looking at it, if you have turnover in your organization, what's causing that? That's a symptom. So what's the root cause of that? If we were to track that down, it could come back to a product line. It could come back to a particular manager. It could come back to a geographical region. So strategic HR, it diagnostic approach. And that diagnostic approach is that we look for issues within an organization and we use our expertise to diagnose and try and get to root cause. We saw a root cause. And what's going to happen as a result of that, the business performance will increase as it relates to whatever that symptom was. Thank you, Ron, for your insights and for being a part of our show. Thank you so much. And it was a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you. Dear viewers, thank you for watching our show. Make sure to follow us so you don't miss our next episodes. You can watch a recording of this broadcast or other episodes on our YouTube and Vimeo channels. And if there is a topic you would like us to prepare for you, feel free to write us a message or a comment and we will review it with our content team. Until next time, stay tuned.